All right, welcome everybody. For anybody who has not uh, met me yet, I am uh, Dominic Torno. I'm a principal engineer here at uh, Temporal. And uh, today, this last presentation, we want to talk about building event-driven reactive applications with Temporal. And the subtitle is Workflows versus Sagas, Epic Showdown. So when we talk about event-driven and uh, reactive applications, we run into an issue that we run into in the context of software engineering all the time. And that is, you ask three people and you will get five different opinions. So I will add the sixth opinion uh, to all of those. So let's try to explore together what we mean by event-driven, what we mean by reactive, what uh, workflows are, and what uh, sagas are. So to start uh, this out, to start the whole journey, how did we get there? And why is uh, event-driven, why is reactive, why is that all the hype? Well, we start where we usually start. Um, when we talk about uh, modern software, and that is, we talk about, well, it all started with uh, the monolith. So our applications were monolithic. There were, there were one cohesive unit, but that didn't mean that our applications were uh, one big ball of mud, right? So we talk a lot about um, the modular monolith. The monolith was already um, composed of uh, individual uh, modules. Now, at some point in time, we uh, ran into limitations. We ran into technical limitations, and we ran into uh, organizational limitations, which um, motivated us, motivated a lot of us, to take the um, monolith and uh, break it apart. So, however, the application was one coherent application, and it has to be one coherent application. Again, it is not just some um, set of uh, services, some set of microservices. From the user's perspective, it is still one coherent application. So, what we decomposed must now be recomposed. So, we still have to have one coherent unit, one coherent application. And the question is, how do we compose? And what do we compose? Because if we look at this, um, this illustration, it has a structural um, aspect to it. It is uh, structural properties. We look at the illustration of the structure of a system. However, we are often interested in the, in the behavior of a system, right? It's a, it's a dynamic system. A dynamic system shows behavior. So we are interested in processes. Um, when we decompose a monolithic application into microservices, we now also decompose um, the individual processes not only across um, time, that is a defining characteristic about a process to begin with, that it takes a certain amount of time. Now we also decompose it spatially. So we have decomposed it temporally and um, spatially. So our uh, previously coherent execution is now composed of uh, multiple executions. And um, something that we can see that is um, a, a characteristic of, um, uh, of the individual, uh, individual executions in our system is that at the very top, what we usually see as the top, what we usually see as the root of the behavior, our, um, our business process, it has a coordination aspect to it. And the further we go down, it has an execution aspect to it. That is what we, call, what we talk about in Temporal all the time. Workflows, right? So you have workflows and you have activities. 
workflows are the um, coordination uh, of your system. The activities are the execution. So when you look at the coordination aspect, then um, usually you do not have any side effects in the, in the system. And the further you go down, the further you come down to the, um, uh, to the atomic steps in the system, the more you have side effects. Side effects could be something is writing to a database, something is uh, writing to um, a message queue, something is sending an email. These are the actual side effects. And at the top, we have the coordination. Now, that also lines up with our notion of what is long-lived and what is short-lived. And uh, long-lived is a, it's a difficult, a flawed term, because it is not necessarily the case that this is actually a long execution, right? For some of us, long-lived is a mere minute. Others, long-lived is an hour, could be a day, it could be a week, a month, year, years. So what is long-lived to me may be something else. That what is long-lived to you? So what is the defining characteristic of uh, long-lived? Well, that is usually that our processes at the, at the uh, very top, these long-lived processes, they don't have an inherent time limit. And uh, they also shall execute as if in the absence of um, failure. So typically, I do not retry at that level. What does it even mean to retry something at a, at a coordination level? Let's say I have a subscription workflow, and that subscription workflow um, runs for uh, once every month, for example, um, Let's uh, take a, a Netflix membership. That has inherently no time limit. Nobody's going to take my Netflix account from me anytime soon. So inherently that does not have a time limit, yet happens once uh, a month when I, when I renew my subscription. What does that mean when I signed up? I don't know, 2007, when I signed up and that fails and I retry? Am I going to go back to 2007? That doesn't even make sense, right? So uh, on this level, on the coordination level and the long-lived level, we do not have inherent time limits and we must execute as if in the absence of uh, failure. Now when we come down, when we come down to the, to the um, execution aspect of things, that's a little different. That is where individual things actually do map to function executions, individual function executions. Function executions have a time limit. Function executions may actually fail. This is where, uh, in order to avoid the time limits, I need to break up my functions in actual short-lived functions, or my executions in short-lived functions. And if something happens there, if they go wrong, right? if the underlying resource ceases to exist, and therefore my function execution ceases to exist, that is where retries come into play. I can totally retry on, uh, on that level. Retrying writing to the database, retrying uh, writing to a message queue, or retrying sending an email, hopefully not too many times. So we, we have this, uh, in summer, we have this, uh, this um, at least two levels of uh, different processes. The ones that have more of a coordination aspect, that coordinate the executions. The ones that are more long-lived that uh, coordinate the executions of the more um, short-lived ones. So the question arises, how do we actually implement that? That is our question. On the, uh, on the bottom uh, things uh, where we have executions and where we have short-lived, we have basically no question. We have figured that out long ago. We can map those executions to mere function executions. But how do we implement the long-lived coordi long coordinating executions? That is a um, different question. And there we have two, I would argue, at least two mainstream notions. How should we do this? And uh, the two competing ideas here are around um, orchestration 
and around choreography. And just like with um, event driven itself, which we actually still did not answer yet, um, what is event driven? There is lots of um, lots of questions and explanations. What actually is orchestration and what actually is choreography? So let's look into that a little bit. So for orchestration, I just want to point out, if you look at this illustration, the illustration alone um, depicts a process, right? It depicts a behavior. Step one, step two, step three. That's going to be interesting once we compare that to choreography. So just keep that in mind, that here the illustration depicts a process. So let's um, just list a few of the common terms that are associated with uh, orchestration. So when we think orchestration, we often think command-based. We think request response. Right? Something is driving. And driving, that basically means there is a very explicit control flow. It is very direct. So the coordinator calls the executor, calls the first executor, calls the second, calls the third. Oftentimes, we associate orchestration with intra-domain. If anybody is into, into domain-driven uh, um, development, domain-driven design, we say, oh yeah, orchestration is cool. Yeah? You can do that intra-domain, but don't do it inter-domain. Do not do it across, um, across services. Stay in your domain when you do it. And why are we saying that? Because we associate orchestration with um, high coupling. Is that fair? Is that fair to do? Keep that in mind. Is that fair to do? Okay, before we answer that question, let's go into choreography. So, so if you look at this illustration, that is different. This illustration does not depict behavior. This illustration depicts the structure of the system, where you have something like an event bus uh, in, the, in the center, and individual services talk to the event bus, read, to the, uh, read from the event bus, write to the event bus. Now, what do we usually associate with orchestration? With orchestration, we like to think orchestration is event-based coordination. So, in that sense, that is already the first hint that we say, okay, event-driven systems are usually orchestrated systems. There is something to that. So, but what else do we mean when we say, well, it is event-based coordination? Event-based coordination hints to an implicit control flow, not an explicit control flow. I don't have a um, requester and I don't have a request a response. Now I raise an event and I listen to an event. So in that uh, sense, the control flow is indirect. So I actually do not have explicit behavior in the system. The behavior of the system emerges. That is something that we should also keep in mind. And uh, now the notion is, well, event-based, that is really cool for interdomain. You want to use event-based coordination to coordinate um, interdomain, to coordinate across services. Why? Because um, orchestration leads to loose coupling. Okay. That, I would argue, is uh, the common wisdom. Now, again, um, you can ask uh, three different people and you will get five different opinions. But I think most of what we said so far is um, fairly agreeable. But I want to challenge that notion and say that um, that is actually not correct. Um, um, neither orchestration nor... Choreography, thank you. Oh, that's unfortunate. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, copy paste. That shall say choreography. Thank you. 
So, and uh, we will immediately move on from that. Yeah? <laughs> Man, okay, but it's a very important point. But luckily we have a summary slide that is actually correct. Okay, good, good. So, uh, in summary, we have the long-lived, uh, um, we need, we need long-lived um, coordination. How can we implement that? We can implement it either via orchestration or we can implement it via choreography. Orchestration is command-based. Orchestration is imperative. Orchestration is what we think of as uh, tightly coupled. Now, choreography, we think, is uh, event-based. Choreography is declarative, and for whatever reason, we think that uh, that is actually loosely coupled. But I want to challenge that notion. Um, just because something is command-based does not mean that it is tightly coupled, and just because something is event-based does not mean that it is loosely coupled. Sometimes, actually, the opposite is true. By the way, my favorite definition, and we will see that in action in just a moment, is what is actually imperative, what is declarative. We hear that a lot, right? So it's like, if anybody ever hears uh, the term Kubernetes, uh, about two seconds later, you're going to hear that it's a declarative system. What does it even mean? So my favorite definition of imperative is that an imperative system or an, an imperative program is a sequence of um, instructions, whereas a declarative system is a set of instructions. It does not specify a certain flow. Now, let's look at that as an example. We want to implement a flow. So on the top, we still have the coordination. We want to implement the flow. And that flow is uh, made up of three individual executions, A, B, and C. Now, again, the coordination, the coordination happens at the top and the execution happens at the bottom. So A, B, and C are the ones that actually um, executes your side effects. So A, B, and C is what we are after. And now there is an um, interesting notion of equivalence in the, in the uh, formal, formal semantic community, there's a very strong notion of equivalence that is called uh, bisimulation. But um, in a general sense, equivalence just means that, hey, however we make sure that we call A, then we call B, and then we call C, um, however we do that, one way is completely equivalent to the other way. But they may actually differ in the developer experience. Let's look at one way. I would argue anybody here would say, okay, this is as imperative as it gets. I call A, I call B, I call C. All right, let's, quick show of hands. Who thinks this is uh, orchestration? Okay, who thinks this is choreography? Okay, this is in the classic definition, closer to orchestration. Because it is command-based, the command is call A, call B, call C. It's direct, it has a direct, um, uh, it, um, dire it's an explicit control flow, direct. But let's look at a different implementation, one that is equivalent because it also calls A and B and C in that order. Whoa, now this is already like a whole different word. And there we have an event handler. We have one event handler. That event handler can listen to um, four different event. Flow requested, that is the invocation of the flow. A returned, B returned, and C returned. Okay, all of this is already pretty strange to me. So what are we gonna do? The very first line says, well, if we see an event flow requested, we trigger an event A requested. So apparently we have an event handler somewhere that actually executes our execution, reacts to A requested, and then triggers A returned. Well, what do we do if we get A returned? Well, look at that. 
we have uh, we have an event handler, or I'm sorry, we have an, a section in our event handler that um, reacts to A returned and triggers B requested, and so on and so forth. Now it's getting a little boring, so we do not need to go through that. But as we see, this is definitely a um, equivalent implementation, but it's very different. That is actually declarative, as there is no sequence. It's just a set of instructions. It's an imperative control flow. The behavior of the system emerges at runtime. It depends on the sequence of events that, and the event history that uh, we see. One moment. It, it depends on the sequence of uh, events and the event history that we see. And um, the, the behavior, unlike in the previous example, the behavior of the system will come to life as the system moves uh, through its lifetime. Let's look at one more example that is entirely equivalent. Here we don't have one event handler, we have multiple event handlers, but it's basically the same idea. They are just not folded into one, they are folded into many. Flow requested, which will trigger an um, A requested, then A returned, which will trigger a B requested, and so on and so forth. So, um, when, you, when you look at uh, uh, when you look at the second and the third example, well, since the first example was uh, orchestration, the second and the third example already hints to um, event-based choreography. In fact, the previous one, where we had one event handler, um, will remind us about the saga pattern. And the second one, where we have multiple event handlers, these are typically not called sagas, as they are more uh, one steps. They are just uh, called event handlers. So here we have an event-based system. And all three implementations are equivalent since they are calling A, B, and C in the same order. Yet, I would argue that the developer experience when you have to implement that as, a, as, an, as an actual system, differs quite a lot. And in order to make all of this a little more graspable, because I do have a tendency to speak in like very abstract terms, so I actually do have an example. And I could actually use a double shot right now, I'm not entirely sure about all of you, but uh, this is one of my favorite examples, and that is uh, Amazon uh, dash button. Unfortunately, that one is discontinued, but I always thought it's pretty cool because all you have to do is you push the button and then uh, the button will um, order, in this case, a double shot. No other uh, interaction uh, needed. So let's see how we could implement that, both as a classic orchestration example and as a choreography example. Okay, let's take this business process. So, um, when we implement the dash button, we usually, or I want to argue Amazon at that point, had the chance to already uh, rely on a huge set of services. There was uh, the payment service was already uh, implemented, in inventory service, shipping service. So we can rely on these uh, services already. And the only things we are interested in here now is the process payment and the refund payment, the process item and the restock items, and the ship items. Okay, and we want to implement this flow, the business process, the coordination, that when I push the button, that uh, we move through the individual stages, we uh, get the payment, we get the item ready, and uh, we ship the item. So our pro yes, uh, it's like our process very straightforward. So again, process payment, process item, ship the item. So how can we actually make that happen? One thing that is also very important is since we do not have um, transactions in, in these scenarios because uh, our business processes are composed of individual steps and typically transactions cannot outlive the execution steps unless you have distributed, application, uh, distributed transactions which are usually not available to us. We need to deal with failure. 
So how do we deal with failure? Usually with uh, compensation. Now, oftentimes we talk about compensation in the context of event-based systems and in the context of uh, sagas specifically, but compensation is not specific to event-based or sagas. Anywhere where I do not have a um, transaction context that lives as long as my coordination, but only as long as the individual executions, I need to deal with compensation, to basically roll back the changes that I already did in case of my business process um, failing in the middle. All right, let's look at an event-based system. Let's look at what we need to do when we want to coordinate um, the long-lived execution via events. So the first one we typically have uh, what we call a command. That is how the user kicks off the process. That is when I push the button, then we have a command place order. So that command goes to, for example, the checkout service. And um, the checkout service then translates that command into an event order placed. Now the payment service is wired up so that nobody's actually calling the payment service, I'm just listening. I'm just listening to, the, uh, to that event order placed. From there on, the payment service will um, go ahead and collect the payment and then raise an event that says uh, payment received. Well, from there on, we are basically just going through the chain. The behavior of our business process emerges. The, the inventory listens to payment received, um, we'll prepare the items and or process the items and then emit the event uh, items processed and then the shipment service listens to that event and uh, eventually uh, when, the, when the shipment is uh, on its way uh, trigger the event order shipped. Okay, so far so good. For this particular business process that uh, event chain straightforward. Is it so? Is it actually that straightforward? So if I, the order placed event, there's a good chance the order placed event has all of the informations about the order. All of the informations about the order may actually mean that the event is self-contained um, from the point of view of the payment service. All information that I need about uh, making the payment happen may actually be in the order placed event. Okay, so then the payment, um, uh, the, the payment service raises the uh, payment received event. Now the inventory service needs to make sure that we process the items. Will the payment received event contain all of the information, including the list of items that we are actually now, that we need to prepare? Maybe. So maybe in the system that you designed, all of that information is actually available. But maybe it is not. Maybe we need to listen to more than one event. Maybe the inventory service actually needs to listen to order placed and uh, payment received in order to get enough information to do what the inventory service needs to do. And that is probably also true for the shipment because the event items processed may not contain the information letting you know where the uh, shipment needs to go. So that obviously already complicates our event chain quite a bit. And we are oddly dependent in different uh, services on different amounts of, e uh, on different types of events. Now you could of course argue and say, well, in that case, the events do not contain all the information. Maybe the events just contain the information where I get more information from. But now we have to throw in a few more um, databases and access to databases. And is it really the best idea for the inventory service to then call out to the checkout service and ask for more information? Well, we already see that this, uh, this idea that we had 
that event-based system makes for loose coupling, makes it, uh, makes it uh, fairly flexible, is already being challenged a bit. Okay. If you look at the, at the orchestration flow, that is somewhat different. The process, it's, it's very direct, it's command-based. The process is uh, completely reflected in that sequence, um, process item, process payment, and ship item, especially if these individual, uh, individual steps we could, in, this is a temporal conference, so we can think of these individual steps as, for example, um, child workflows. So very uh, well contained. One other uh, aspect that you're seeing here is actually failure handling. I tried to get failure handling into the, into the previous picture and I failed miserably. That already made it so complicated that I didn't want to walk anybody through that. So, but uh, if you look at the, at the compensation logic on this level, that is actually everything is very straightforward. So I don't think there is much we can talk about here. But let's do a twist. Yeah, because, I mean, everything has to have turns and twists, every good story. Yeah? So let's throw in a twist. So remember the business, the original business process was we process the payment, we process the item, and then we ship the items. All right. Our um, market team or cust uh, customer uh, satisfaction team figured out, you know what? Most of the time, we get the money anyways, all right? So let's make sure we process the items immediately as soon as we uh, push the button to make sure we get these items out the door as fast as possible. So now we're switching up our business process to process item, process payment, ship items. Okay, what does that do to our event chain? Remember that was our event chain. We didn't exactly know if the inventory service and the shipment service listened to order placed, but let's make it pretty simple and argue that they didn't, right? Okay, so we had the uh, event-driven uh, um, system over here. We were arguing that it was all fairly flexible and uh, fairly loosely coupled. Let's see what happens. All right, so we need to break up this chain, right? So we need to alter the emergent behavior. In order to alter the emergent behavior, we need to now start to listen to different events. So the payment service cannot listen to the order placed no more, and the inventory service cannot listen to the payment received anymore. Instead, the inventory service now needs to be changed so that it listens to a different event. So we need to reach to a different service wire it up differently so that now the inventory service listens to order placed. The, okay. <laughs> you good? Okay. That was unexpected. So we have the inventory service. The inventory service uh, still raises uh, items processed. However, the shipment service cannot listen to items processed anymore. That is a little bit premature. First, the payment service needs to listen to, um, to the items processed event. And now, in order to complete the event chain, uh, the shipment service now listens to the payment received event. All right. One flip. We changed the order of two steps. We basically touched each and every component of the system. Let's see what that does to our orchestration-based workflow. Previous, the end. Because we have an explicit, um, an explicit flow, all we have to do is actually change the number of steps around and, of course, also change um, the, compens the compensating actions. But the changes here are actually fairly innocent. Not much happened. Right? So um, again, I did not draw this out because I gave up. I didn't want to talk anybody through that. But let's do this. What if we um, had a uh, preferred 
customer segment and a regular customer segment, the preferred customers, we do not wait for the payment. We immediately process the items and ship the items because we, uh, for our preferred customers, we assume that uh, the payment will go through later. However, regular customers, we want uh, for regular customers to first collect the payment, then um, uh, process the items and uh, ship the items. So anybody can think of how that event chain or event mesh or event mess may look like, but I didn't want to draw it out. But if you want to think about how that's going to look like in an imperative program in a workflow, there is uh, one if-then-else statement that should actually take care of your issue. All right, and now let's look at the, let's look at the last uh, uh, the uh, last change to the business process. In this change, uh, we are not changing the, in this business process, we are not changing the sequence. All we want to do is let's send out emails, right? Because all of us want to be in the loop of what happens with our, with our business process. So here, we just change this up and after each and every step, we send a confirmation email to uh, our user that uh, we got the payment, the items are processed, and the items are shipped now with the tracking code. Okay. So here, once again, we have our simple original event chain. And we throw in a notification service. That notification service is the one that sends the emails, and that notification service, in our situation, needs to listen to three events the payment received event, the items processed event, and the order shipped event. Okay, so the payment service depends on, uh, I'm sorry, the, the email sending service depends on three events. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, for our business process, once again, that is fairly straightforward. Um, I think we all can all anticipate what's going to happen. We throw in, uh, I took out the uh, failure code, so it's not that much. We throw in a few statements. We throw in send email. In that, we supply the arguments because we are command based. That is, the caller supplies the arguments to the callee. And here we have the payment process template that we want the email service to use. Uh, throw in a bag of data, render the template, send it out. The same is true for items process template and um, item ship template. Now, how does that actually look like? So if I have an order workflow and I want to send three different emails, I introduced one more dependency. No question about that. So. Um, the order workflow now depends on the uh, send email action. And the order workflow is the one that is responsible to provide the arguments to the send email action. The send email action is not at all dependent on the order workflow. All it wants is a template or um, the information where it can get and download the template, and um, data, for example, hash map, in order to be able to render the email and then send it um, to the user. But how does that look like in, a, in choreography, in an event-driven? So we have one service, you would think one fairly independent, standalone service, send email, that now needs to listen to three different events. It also needs to know how to extract the information that it needs to send an email from three different events that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So there is probably nothing you can reuse uh, and there is no, no, I, no common idea of how to get a template for uh, one of these events. So a very standalone-ish service actually has a dependency, is coupled to three different events. So, I mean, <laughs> Baby Yoda had to make an, exp an appearance and therefore also the Mandalorian. 
So, um, in uh, summary, event-driven reactive applications with temporals. Workflows versus sagas, the epic showdown. What was my takeaway? So, typically we talk about um, orchestration versus choreography. But, as we saw, there is an equivalence between orchestration and choreography as long as uh, either the orchestrated or the choreographed implementation of your business process uh, implements your business process, there is uh, no difference on the, there is no technical difference, there is only a difference in the developer experience. Now in the developer experience we typically say that orchestration comes with um, imperative style, tight coupling. We say that it is inflexible. And we think that choreography, it comes with um, event-based uh, coordination. It is very flexible, it comes loosely coupled. But if you uh, look at these examples, this is too, um, too narrow of a statement or too broad of a statement. I would argue that uh, for many times orchestration will actually give you the better developer experience because it is fairly easy to reason about imperative systems and it's also fairly easy to change and evolve um, imperative systems. While, as we saw in this particular example, um, event-based uh, systems sagas where we have um, implicit control flow and the behavior of the system emerges. It is A, fairly hard to reason about the system as a whole. There is no single uh, point, no single place where I could look and understand the behavior of the system and changing the system and the evolution of the system is also fairly challenging. And the idea that just because we have event-based systems, we have a very loose coupling can also be challenged with examples, very simple innocent looking examples, like introducing, sending an email after each and every step. And with that, thank you very much. We did, uh, we, uh, we did um, finish this presentation just a little bit ahead of time. So uh, in case anybody has uh, any questions or anybody has any uh, comments, I am uh, very happy to try to answer them. Please. So the, the question is, uh, can, we, uh, can we actually find a workaround? Can we work around that? So for example, if we wanted to um, send email after each and every step, why don't we have the uh, payment service and the inventory service and the shipment service raise an additional event? And that event, could, that event has more of a command quality where uh, we say send email and uh, has more of a command quality where we say um, send email. Um, and uh, I would argue that uh, this is where we get into the, uh, into the uh, situation where uh, we started off, and that is actually, that happens a lot. We started off um, with this notion, oh, we're gonna be purely event driven. Right? And then we see where there are situations where this event-driven notion falls apart. And that is where we then also enter, okay, let's enter commands into our system. Instead of one event, especially like a domain event, let's also raise other events or let's uh, raise commands. And uh, in that case, I would argue, eventually you are worse off. You started with a modular monolith, which was actually fairly uh, easy to maintain and evolve and change compared to now one uh, big distributed ball of mud where uh, you basically just raise wildly raise events and commands 
and um, crisscross listen to them. But uh, yes, it's a very it's a very common uh, it's a it's a very common pattern. Uh, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, so just uh, thinking about the benefits of orchestration over choreography, and in some it seems like there's some situations where orchestration is superior. What are the situations where choreography is superior? And I'm kind of imagining some hybrid situation where the more densely coupled parts of the system are using orchestration and then between, I guess it's like the inter-domain, intra-domain. Can you say something about where, where choreography is more valuable? Um, let me put it this way. I, it's like I, I'd uh, rather not make a, ge a general statement um, about that, but what I am very, very off, and that is also what we were looking at a lot today, is where you have orchestration in disguise of choreography, right? So it's like in, in choreography that is very often uh, request response driven, right? No, I'm sorry, in orchestration that is very often request response driven. Um, when you see um, when you see orchestr when you see choreography chains that actually just reflect requests and responses. Right? But then you give it a fancy name, like, um, I don't know, payment requested yeah, is the event. And then payment processed is the next event. That is basically the request comes in and the response comes back. Right? And uh, for me, that is um, uh, orchestration in disguise of choreography. And for that, you get uh, basically uh, all of the drawbacks and none of the rewards. So that is, where, that is where I would make a more general statement. But um, I would rather not make two general statements about uh, choreography in general. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, so question is, what is the best strategy, in your opinion, to associate uh, related events and group them? Uh, so let's say a particular side effect depends on more than one event being completed. How do you make sure that it only accounts for the ones that are related to each other before it fires and also ensures that all of the relevant events of a particular event group have been emitted before that action in a service is executed? That is a um, that is an excellent question that uh, would actually make each and every single example of uh, of this presentation even more painful when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, choreography. So there is um, there is a um, a fairly cool uh, saga tutorial out there, and uh, I will share the links uh, later on uh, temporal Slack on the water cooler. If you Google for N service bus and sagas, they have a, a pretty cool uh, example out there, and um, um, in in they they have a they have a particular solution to that problem when you do event correlation. First, when you look at the individual events you actually have to make sure that you find the correct instance of the business process, right? Because order one, two, three is completely different from order two, three, four. So first off, you need to find the right order of the business process. Then second, you actually need, uh, sometimes you need to wait for multiple events. This is where sagas get more complicated and you definitely have to throw in state handling. Now in that case, when that saga gets an event, that saga needs to remember that it already got event one, but not event two, or if it gets event two, then it must remember that it got event two, not event one, and then when it gets the other event, then it triggers uh, some behavior. And uh, with that, the explicit state machine that you need to manage becomes way, way, way harder. Whereas that state machine you do not necessarily explicitly have to manage if you use uh, imperative, uh, imperative code, if you use orchestration, because in an, imperative, in an imperative system, the sequence of events, you actually have an implicit state machine, right? And the state is just a program counter, and our, our entire runtime manages that for us. 
Of course, sometimes you do have to coordinate a little bit. In the case of uh, temporal, for example, sometimes you do have to be able to react to signals and uh, also wait for uh, multiple signals. But because of the uh, routing of uh, temporal, at least you do not have to worry about the fact that the uh, signals find the right receiver. Please. So first of all, thank you very much. It's really, you have touched on some very interesting kind of topic areas here. So I'm curious too and wondering what your comment is, right, about like compensation uh, mechanism in Saga. I mean, does it actually break, you know, stateless type of um, implementation, especially when we're talking about cloud native, it's supposed to be all stateless. And then you're doing Saga, you need to worry about compensation, then you have to remember the state and all these things, so. Compensation is, uh, so compensation is an, is an interesting topic. For uh, many people, um, compensation is a defining criteria of uh, the saga pattern. I actually argue that compensation is not a defining criteria of the saga pattern, um, but it is a very common, uh, uh, a very common occurrence of the, uh, of the saga. And uh, you are um, entirely correct. So even if you manage to implement a, a stateless saga, as soon as it comes to compensation, you probably have to remember steps that you already have taken. Right? In order to be able then to call compensating actions on the steps that you already have taken. So, um, but most of the time, business processes are not stateless to begin with most of the time business processes do carry state. So when it comes to compensation and sagas, I would argue that only in, when you get really, really lucky, yeah, did you not already have to worry about state before you, uh, before you added um, compensation, only if you got really, really lucky. But um, the state machine of rolling back just in, in sagas, explicitly managing that state machine just became very, very hard. Because if you look at our imperative code, if you look at, for example, Java, and you look at the try um, catch block, and nested try catch blocks, that control flow primitive is very, very powerful. That resulting state machine um, is actually very difficult to implement by hand. And in case of sagas, that's exactly what you have to do. Any other questions? Please. So it seems to me that <clears throat> even driven model can make it easy to do things in parallel. For example, if we take your dash button um, event driven model shipping service, uh, so for you could do payment and uh, item processing in parallel and then shipping could listen for both and when both happen, then you ship the item, right? But if it's a imperative model, then you have to do in sequence, or you you create some kind of uh, threads or go routines or whatever, and then you have to wait for both, which becomes more complicated. So um, I would I would argue that in the uh, case of uh, choreography, where you kick off multiple sub processes that are truly uncoordinated, multiple pro sub processes that are completely independent of each other, multiple processes that are truly concurrent, right? Then that can actually work. If you, however, have a branch out, so basically a fork and join pattern, if at any point in time you need to coordinate these sub processes again. Uh, then uh, you do have um, uh, you, you do have the problem where you actually once again have to wait for multiple events and uh, coordinate and remember what events you already um, what events you already saw and which events you didn't see. Whereas if you have an imperative style like um, uh, Java or Go that have um, uh, the the uh, concurrency primitives basically baked in or as available as a library. Um, I would argue that as from a developer experience, you still have an, have an uh, easier choice. I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Okay, 
If there is not, then I think we just reached the conclusion of the uh, very first day of um, Temporal's inaugural developer conference replay. It was an absolute pleasure to have uh, everybody here. I hope uh, you enjoyed it uh, just as uh, much as we did. It was absolutely fantastic to uh, see everybody in person. Um, it was a uh, great turnout. We did not expect to have uh, this many people here on day one. We are super excited um, that uh, you all came and joined us. And we are very much looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow for the main event. Thank you very much. <laughs>